Hey everyone, good evening. Uh, am I audible and visible to everyone? Can you please confirm? Hello sir, good evening. Yes, you're audible. Okay, okay. Uh, can you guys please turn your videos on? <clears throat> Let's make the session more interactive. So uh, please turn all of your videos on. I can give you a few minutes if you want, so yeah. All right, guys, I can see the participation number increasing. Uh, we'll just wait for a few minutes before we begin. So in the meanwhile, please, guys, get ready to turn your videos on as well. Okay, so go ahead. All right, uh, I guess we could uh, begin. Guys, I don't see you guys on videos. Please turn your videos on. Uh, Arshi. Azar, Shahad, Steve, Nitin, Pradeep, and Shreya. Please turn your videos on. And you can personally message me if there's any challenges or anything like that. So, Great to meet you, Arshi and Shreya. Uh, the other please, Pradeep as well. All right, uh, so first of all, let's go around with the introductions. Uh, you know, uh, let's get to know each other first of all. So uh, who would like to go first? Like, can anyone volunteer? Anyone would like to volunteer to go first? The answer is always no, I know. So I'll have to just have to pick someone. Uh, Pradeep, could you go first? Yes, great, thank you. Yes, definitely. So, what, uh, what things that I should cover now? Like, uh, yeah, just uh, you can just tell tell us about uh yourself, like your name, where you're from, like where are you in your ACC journey and everything. So, yeah. Yeah, sure. So, my name is Pradeep Kumar. I am a company secretary, uh, already, and uh, currently working with a like uh, Rio Tinto organization. It is a mining. It is an organization with mining industry, uh, with uh, mining area. So I have good exposure of around 10 to 15 years, like 12, 10 to 12 years in finance and accounts already. So since I'm already qualified company secretary, so I just explored the ACCA in terms of what all the opportunities that we have. So yeah, I just availed and then. <laughs> Great, uh, thank yeah, you Yeah, because what I believe, yeah, the learning should continue even though uh, at your at any stage that you're currently so it's, it's already been 10 to 15 years in work <laughs> of work experience but yes i still like to continue my education journey totally understand uh thank you for sharing that uh pretty thank you. so uh and one yeah no, no. okay so uh anyone uh who else would be there uh, i'll just just the guys in the videos for Shreya, can you go ahead good evening sir Good evening. Uh, my name is Shravni Othri and uh, I'm from Itawa, UP. And I'm currently pursuing BCom honors from Shahid Bhagat Singh College, Delhi University. Okay. So you're a full time student now, right? Great. Thank you. Uh, and Arshi, go ahead. Good evening, sir. I'm Arshi from Bhutan. And I'm currently working with KPMG. It's been two years. And uh, now I'm going to explore more into what it's like. Ah, okay. Uh, like. Uh, sorry. Uh, I was asking, like, uh, what are you working as? In keeping. I'm in audit support role currently. 
and what is the code I, to open? Yes, I want to move to board on it. So one of I the see. steps is easy so that's Great, great. Uh, great to you. Then, you know, this would be the paper that you would be preferring first of all, right? Yeah, great. So is this your first paper as well, or like, have you attended any other papers? No, that, this is my first one. First one. Uh, for Pradeep, I guess, for you as well, it's the first one, right? Thank you. What about you, Shreya? So this is my second paper. Second paper. What was the first one, FR? Yes. Great, great. Azure, you can go ahead. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, I can hear you. My name is Azar. And we have met before in the Valley Party. Yeah, right, definitely. Yeah. And currently I'm working. And, mm -hmm. and I'm graduate. And I'm working. Uh, where are you working? Where are you? I based on uh, American MNC. Ah, uh, okay. Great, great. Good to know that. As an associate. Okay. Great, good to know. And, uh, okay, who else should I choose? Are we covered? Yeah, I guess the others are waiting. Okay. Uh, oh, I guess just Yeah. I'm starting my video. So, hi, all. Hi. Um, my yeah, name is Yogi. Just, uh, you know, Sorry. with the camera. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Yoti Sharma. I play a. Uh, Completed my graduation and post graduation as well in 2020, and I'm currently working in as a senior bookkeeper at Outbooks, and still pursuing uh, ACCA. Due to some reasons, I didn't uh, give my first exam, so this will be my first exam. Thank you. All right, guys, uh, I think some of you are facing some issues in turning the videos on. And I, uh, but yeah, guys, take, take your time. We're still going ahead with the introductions. Some of you guys jumped out of the call thinking that, you know, the introductions would be over and then jump back, right? So for those people, you know, thank you, thank you so much. Are we choosing some of their names now? Uh, who would that be? Uh, Dave. Dave, are you there? Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Hi, Dave. Uh, so, can you please give us an introduction about yourself? My name is Dave Rishi Kumar Jha. I'm from Faridabad. Mm -hmm. Currently, mm -hmm. first in CCA. FR is going to my first exam in September. Okay. I see. FR is going to be, but you're still attending the session. Okay. Yes, yes, got it. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing that. And who else? I think we pretty much covered uh, everyone, right? Okay. All right, then. All right, guys. So thank you so much for introducing yourself. So I'll give you a brief introduction about myself. Uh, I am a full-time ACCA member. And currently, well, considering my professional life, I, first of all, uh, am a senior auditor at Ernest & Young. You guys would have heard about Ernest & Young, right? Uh, and more and about it, I also teach students uh, on a part-time basis uh, for all the skill level as well as professional paper level papers of ACC. At skill level, I usually teach like uh, performance management as well as audit and assurance primarily. And at the in professional level, it's advanced audit and assurance and advanced performance management. So, yeah. All right. So, guys, uh, thank you so much uh, for the introductions. I guess we could get started. But before that, I just have one key rule that I, you know, that I'm always, I'm always pretty strict with, and that's to keep your videos turned on at all times during the session, right? Because, uh, you know, I don't want, like, I want to make the session more interactive. I want to understand whether you guys are understanding the concepts or not. Like, otherwise, you have a doubtful phase, or you know, some sometimes you may want to, you know, ask something, but I'll continue on and I'll have to pick you out, right? So, just to understand all these things, just keep your videos turned on at all times. 
I'll give an exemption for some of you for this session because, you know, like must, must have been a surprise for you, right? But uh, starting from the next session on, just ensure that you are turning your videos on as well. So yeah, all right. All right then, uh, then I guess we could get started with audit, right? <clears throat> so who can tell me, like as of now you would, some of you would have a basic idea about as to what audit is and everything, right? Some of you may not know what that term, uh, term means or you may not exactly know what we do here, but I believe there would be some of you who would have a basic idea, right? So who can share that? Like, can someone tell me, like, what's your idea of audit? <clears throat> Anyone like to so volunteer? Or, yeah. I think, uh, okay, uh, Shreya, sure, you can go ahead. So shall I do? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So for me, uh, I think audit means uh, evaluating the financial statements of a company in order to ensure that these financial statements are uh, representing a true and fair value, uh, like true and fair representation of the financial performance and the position of the company, as well as um, they are also in accordance with the accounting standards. Okay. Great. That's a good uh, explanation. Thank you for that, Andrea. And Azar, you can go ahead. Go. I was just saying uh, to verify or to verify the books of accounts, mm -hmm. whether the uh, accounts are accordance with the IFRS. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they perform the IFR as well. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. And uh, yeah, anyone else want to contribute to this? Okay. Uh, we're all good. So what you guys said is absolutely right. The primary object of an auditor would be to, well, to be more specific, I would say it's to provide an opinion on the financial statements of an organization. Okay. So there are many organizations across the globe, different types of organizations. There are huge MNCs and then there are small businesses, medium, uh, medium sized businesses, right? For all of these organizations, like, or I would say, especially for the uh, global MNCs and listed companies, like companies which are listed in a stock exchange or so, these companies will have uh, a requirement to publish their financial statements, right? And what exactly is the financial statements exactly? Like there are five documents that constitutes the financial statement. What are they? Who can tell me? Balance sheet, profit and loss accounting. Profit and loss, yeah. yeah. Statement of profit and loss. Cash flow statement. Statement of cash flow. I'm sorry, not to account. Okay, not to financial statements. Statement yes. of changes in equity. Statement of changes in equity. We like miss the most common one, the balance sheet. Okay, balance statement of sheet. financial position, as we call it. Okay, so these are the five uh, documents that constitute the financial statements. So, as an auditor, what we do is we would provide an opinion on all of these five documents, state, stating that hey, like these are prepared appropriately, they do provide a true and fair view, right? And it is reliable. You can rely on the numbers that are given here, right? Because, guys, the ultimate objective of uh, an auditor, like this is kind of a, or their objective is kind of, uh, you know, uh, we're doing a favor to the society as well. Because, like, what we're trying to do here is we are enabling investors, not just investors, but the stakeholders, right? Stakeholders covers not just the shareholders or not just the, uh, you know, investors uh, that there are, but it covers, it, it's a broader term, right? It includes all, all of the people that are there, such as the, tax authorities, such as the banks, the customers, the suppliers, right? The employees, the management, it covers everyone, right? So we're just providing an assurance. I wouldn't say, I'm, I wouldn't use the term guarantee or anything, right? We're providing an assurance for these uh, individuals, for these stakeholders, that the financial statements provide a true and fair view, the numbers are appropriate, and you can rely on that, right? Right? This is what we do as an auditor, okay? Or this is basically as to what audit is all about, right? 
So that would be the primary thing or this entire audit process would be the primary thing that you guys will be learning throughout this particular paper, right? But more and about that, there are different other services as well, right? For example, like when I talk about audit, this is what it basically is, providing an opinion on the financial statements. But there's also uh, certain other additional services that audit firms provide, such as providing, let's say, internal audit services, such as providing uh, tax services maybe, or uh, maybe they would assist them with reviewing the prospective financial statements. Prospective basically means like futuristic financial statements, like future cash flow projections and everything. So sometimes auditors provide an assurance on that. There's another concept known as due diligence. There's another concept known as forensic audit, right? So all of these services are provided by audit firms. But in this paper, primarily, you will be learning about audit itself, it's just the audit service. Okay. All right. So uh, another thing is, do you think it's a one-man job? What do you think? Is audit a one-man job? Definitely not, right? It's a teamwork, right? It's basically a project that you implement for each and every organization. There would be a time, a project would mean that that particular uh, audit process, or that particular process would have a timeline, right? It would have a certain budget to it, right? They, uh, we would have certain resources aligned to it, and then we execute that particular project, right? So it is kind of like a project itself, right? We plan everything and then execute it. Of course, it differ, like the timeline and everything or the budget and everything will differ depending upon the company that we're auditing. So that's definitely there, but yeah, all right. Okay, so uh, that basically covers the very basic stuff. Uh, I'll just quickly share my screen. <clears throat> But before that, one second. <clears throat> Who's the host from the sequence? Uh, one moment. All right, uh, now. Now I'll share my screen one second. <clears throat> so what you see here is basically what we just covered, right? Uh, as to what an external audit is. Okay, so there is external and internal audit. There is review engagements, right? These are all terms that we will learn. Okay, so just Keep a note of all of these things. So yeah, uh, first of all, we'll cover as to what an external audit is. It's a type of assurance engagement. Assurance engagement is another term. We will cover that shortly. It's a type of assurance engagement that is carried out by an auditor to give an independent opinion on a set of financial statements. So guys, one thing that you have to remember about this particular paper is that there's a lot of technical terms that you have to learn. Okay. The answers that you write in your exam is basically, uh, how do you say it? There's, an, there's a language to it. There's an audit language that you have to uh, you know, learn. And this audit language will contain a lot of technical terms. Easy terms, of course, nothing so complicated as such. But yeah, you have to present your answers. You cannot present your answers in like common language or in very simple terms. You have to sometimes use those technical words here and there to make your answers a bit more precise and specific. Okay. I'll give you a typical example here. Uh, let's say that uh, let's say that I'm hiring you in my audit firm, right? And uh, I am telling you to check the revenue balance, right? If I tell you to check the revenue balance, then what exactly will you do? Think about it. 
check the revenue balance. Are you trying to recalculate it? You don't know. Are you trying to check the completeness of that balance? Are you missing out on anything? Is that what we need to do? Not exactly specific, right? So when I say check something, you know, it's not that specific. But if I tell you to recalculate the revenue balance, or if I tell you to uh, like agree that revenue balance with something else, right? If I ask you to obtain confirmations of that particular balance, then all of these would be a bit more specific, right? So there are these terms that you have to, you know, learn and it's down the line, it's, it'll be easy to catch those terms as well. Uh, you should be able to like, or you should be able to use those particular set of words and lines in the in the exam answers that you be writing. Okay, so that's basically how uh, the audit language works. So yeah. Anyway, anyway, so as of now, in this particular definition itself, there are multiple terms that you just noted, right? External audit, assurance engagement, right? Assurance engagement is something that we will look into later on. Uh, that is carried out by an auditor to give an independent opinion on a set of financial statements. Carried out by an auditor to give an independent opinion. What is it? What is an independent opinion? Earlier, I said that financial statements, uh, you give it, give an opinion on your financial statements, right? But what does independent opinion mean exactly? Independent, independent opinion. opinion. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, independent opinion, I guess it, it, it relies that. So you're giving the bias free opinion on the accounts. If, even if accounts has some biasness or incorrect portfolio has been presented there. So you are uh, marking that out in public. So that is something I guess the independent opinion is. Right, exactly. So basically uh, you are not influenced or you are not biased by anything, right? That's basically the overall uh, idea, okay. So your opinion is your own and it's not influenced in any way by anything else. That's basically the overall idea behind having an independent opinion. Okay. So as an auditor, ideally, you know, when you're giving an opinion on the financial statement, when you're saying that, hey, everything is correct, right? Everything is calculated properly. You know, it should not be influenced by anyone or the management should not influence you in any way or the uh, prepare any other preparers of the financial statement. They should not influence your overall conclusion or overall opinion, right? That's basically the idea here. Okay. Uh, on the set of financial statement. Yes, that's just it. Okay. So uh, this particular first line is something that I simplified from this second line over here. Okay, the second line is basically taken from your uh, like what in 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 financial reporting we've had accounting standards, right? Accounting standards is just uh like IA standards, IFR standards, etc. Right. So like that in audit we have ISA standards or international standards on auditing. Okay. So these are basically taken from the ISAs. So let's read that out as well. An objective of an auditor financial statement is to enable the auditor to express an opinion on uh, on whether the financial statements are prepared in all material respects in accordance with an applicable financial reporting framework. So some more technical terms, basically, right? As you can see, it says in all material respects and applicable financial reporting framework. What exactly is applicable financial reporting framework mean? Well, at first you would be a bit shocked by the technicality in that particular term, but it simply means the relevant accounting standard. That's just it. Okay. Because when we talk about, you know, UK based companies, right? They primarily follow the IAS and IFRS uh, standards, etc. And then there are some, some local accounting standards as well for specific countries in the Europe, right? And more than about that, even in India, we have the Indian accounting standards. In the US, they have US GAAP, right? So there are these local accounting standards that need to be uh, followed, which is why we're not specifically saying that uh, in accordance with IFRS or in, a, in accordance with ISAs, sorry, IAS, right? We're just saying that, you know, whatever is applicable to that financial statement, you know, that's what we're referring to. Clear? Is that clear? I would prefer a yes or no, you know. See, yes, people on video can shake their heads, right? But uh, yeah. Great. Uh, moving on. <clears throat> so now let's talk about as to what assurance engagement is. Okay. <clears throat> uh, 
Assurance engagement is an engagement in which a practitioner obtains sufficient and appropriate evidence in accordance to express a conclusion designed to enhance the degree of confidence of the intended users other than the responsible party about the outcome of the evaluation or measurement of a subject matter against criteria. Now, if you look at the number of technical terms here, there are a lot, right? So what we can do is we can just simply split these into a few sections and then look at it one by one. I'll split it over here as well. Okay, so let's look at it line by line. Okay, so when, whenever there is, uh, you know, something too technical or too complicated, we can simply just break it down and then, you know, look at it one by one. Okay, so first of all, what does it say? An engagement in which a practitioner obtains sufficient and appropriate evidence. Okay, so we have practitioner is basically in the case of an audit, right? So guys, first of all, assurance engagement is a broader term. Okay, as in, as we looked at earlier, external audit is just a type of assurance engagement. There are other types as well, such as review engagement, due diligence, forensic audit, all these things that I've mentioned earlier, right? So there are other types as well. So uh, it is an engagement, like assurance engagement is an engagement. What 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 is what does the engagement mean here exactly? Business engagements, right? Like the professional business engagements that we have, right? That's just it. It's a professional business engagement in which a practitioner, right? There would be someone known as a practitioner. Like in different types of services, we call them different names. For example, in review engagements, we call them reviewers. In audit, we call them auditors, right? Right? In some, uh, you know, some other uh, services, we call them assurers as well, but still, okay. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> practitioner. Okay, we're just giving them a, a broader term, that system. We have a practitioner, and let's con uh, consider the audit service itself, since we are we will be learning that. Uh, in this case, the practitioner would be the auditor itself, right? So it's an engagement where an auditor obtains sufficient and appropriate audit evidence, right? And this is a term that you will be hearing for the entire session that that will be that we will be looking at, okay? Because uh, sufficient and appropriate is basically sufficient and appropriate evidence is like a is, don't consider it as three separate words, right? It's just considered that to be a single you know word itself, right? Because every evidence that we collect, or every set of evidence that we uh, we collect for the audit, should be sufficient, which means that it should be a, of the appropriate quantity, and it should be appropriate, which means that it should be of the appropriate quality as well. Okay, okay. So, in an assurance engagement, we have someone known as a practitioner collecting sufficient and appropriate evidence. Now, the next question that should come to you is why? Why are we doing this? Right. And the answer is over here. In order to express a conclusion, we gather evidence to express a conclusion. Right? Simple as that. Why, why exactly are we doing this? To enhance a degree of confidence of the intended users other than the responsible party. Intended users are basically the people who rely on the financial statements. Okay. Okay. There are a few people like like the stakeholders that I mentioned earlier, right? There's the shareholders, there's the uh, you know tax authorities, the suppliers, the customers, all these people, right? So they rely on the uh, financial statement. So in order to enhance their degree of confidence, what do we do? We collect sufficient appropriate evidence and we reach a conclusion. Okay, okay. But but one uh, word that you have to note here is it says other than the responsible part. What does that mean? Who is responsible for preparing the financial statements? Who can tell me this? Who is responsible for preparing the financial statements? Companies responsible. Companies. Okay. Who specifically, or which team specifically in the company? Accountants. Accountants, yeah. Right. And uh, who does the accountants report to? Government Shahad just, uh, not exactly. Shahad just, uh, yeah, mentioned the answer. Directors, okay, board of directors. Like the ultimate responsibility for, you know, preparing the financial statements would lie with the 
board of directors itself, right? Of course, yeah, the ultimate, the groundwork is done by the accounting team, right? And this is then later on reviewed by the management and ultimately it should be, you know, approved by the board of directors. The ultimate accountability lies with the board of directors, the people who run the company, right? So that's the responsible party. Responsible party are the people who are, uh, you know, preparing the financial statements and whatever we are reviewing. Okay, that's basically it. So this is just to enhance the degree of confidence of the intended users other than the responsible party, which means that we are, you know, providing confidence for whosoever is relying on the financial statements, but not for those people who have prepared the financial statements. Okay, that's basically as to what it means here. Right. And uh, yeah. And finally, about the outcome of the evaluation or measurement of a subject matter against criteria. So we are measuring something and we're evaluating something. What are we, uh, what are we evaluating? The subject matter, right? Subject matter is basically, in, a, in the case of an audit, it's basically the financial statements. Okay. Okay. Uh, like there are different subject matters. For example, uh, if you remember the term that I use, prospective financial statements, right? If I talk about prospective financial statements, like there would be future cash flows and stuff like that. So the subject matter would just be the future cash flows itself, right? It won't be uh, the financial statement as a whole. Right. So the subject matter will de differ depending upon the service. But in the case of an audit, it's basically the financial statement as a whole. OK. All right. Uh, and we're comparing or we're just evaluating this particular subject matter against a criteria. What criteria are we talking about here? <clears throat> basically, the accounting standards. That's just it. OK, because ultimately these financial statements are prepared on the basis of the accounting standards. So we're just comparing it against it and then making sure that everything has been you know done appropriately or not okay simple as that any questions here regarding any of these lines or any of the concepts that we just discussed all right uh then moving on so now we have to discuss the uh five elements of an uh, assurance engagement, which is just a discussion of all the terms that technical terms that we used. Okay. All right. So uh, in order to do that, let's have a look at the first one over here. The first element of an assurance engagement is, uh, well, there's no order to it, but yeah, randomly. Uh, there, there's a reason why I've chose this particular order. Okay. Because there's a mnemonic that you can use to memorize this particular elements of assurance engagement. Okay. And uh, we call that CREST, C-R-E-S-T. You can note that down. C-R-E-S-T. Okay. CREST. Right. So the first C basically stands for criteria. Okay. Criteria. So we're talking about the criteria which is used to evaluate the financial statements. Okay, that's basically as to what we are trying to do here, uh, right? So, uh, the, what is the criteria exactly? Basically, the accounting, uh, you know, standards, IFRS, IAS, Indian standards, US GAAP, right, or any other local standards for that matter. Okay, uh, and then we have another aspect, which is report. See, we talk about providing, uh, you know, opinions, right, independent opinion and everything. So how do we provide the opinion? Because we can't just, uh, you know, enter, walk into the board of directors room and announce our opinion or maybe post our opinion in Twitter or something, right? Because there's a formal process to it. And this formal process is what is known as uh, or the, you know, reporting basically. And then we report, we have something known as the independent auditors report in the case of an audit, right? And that's where we, uh, you know, publish our overall opinion. Okay. All right. If that's the case, then uh, how many of you guys have seen an annual report? Or an auditor's report? Pretty sure the working professionals would have seen it on, the, on a daily basis. But uh, yeah, anyone who hasn't? No, right? No worries. I can show you one. One second. Uh, the first term that I used as an annual report. Annual report is basically the, you know, financials, the report that contains the financial statements and several other aspects, which is 
published by the company on an annual basis. Okay, so uh, for the respective financial years, of course. Uh, so uh, yeah, I don't uh know like since some of you guys are full time students as well, let me tell you this as well. Like when it comes to annual reports, it's not just the financial statements. Okay, there are certain other aspects as well. There's other uh key figures that's published. Then there's some non-financial aspects such as uh you know the, the company's social responsibility related aspects there are things like carbon emissions and stuff like that environmental aspects just like, nowadays a really key topic and uh, this is for all of your awareness as well a really key thing that's like a really hot topic at the moment is sustainability okay okay some of you may have heard of it right because uh sustainability like is a concept that has been introduced in multiple acc papers as well because it's a really, you know, key thing that companies are trying to improve upon. So, yeah, be aware of that. So, all of these aspects are published. So, let me see if I have one. I should have one here somewhere. So, guys, this is basically an annual report of Huawei Investments and Holdings Pool Limited. Okay. This is not really a client that I audit as such, right? I primarily audit US clients, not, uh, you know, clients based in the UK as such. Uh, ACCAs can do that just for the information of others as well. In fact, I uh, audit one of the uh, biggest clients anyway, so yeah, that's there. So uh, Huawei is basically uh, is something an organization which I researched on as part of my, uh, well, I haven't spoken about my education qualification, right? Sorry for that. Okay, so uh, basically, uh, in addition to ACCA, like I have two bachelors for some reason. Like one is obviously, you know what? Make a guess. What would be one of my bachelor's degrees? What would it be? Make a guess. Random guess. Science. Huh? Bcom. Yeah. What else? <laughs> <laughs> Like everyone, everyone who has taken the commerce field, I also have a BCom. But in addition to that, I also have a bachelor's in science, yes, uh, a BSc in applied accounting, basically, more specific. So uh, that's basically an, a degree that you get in addition to your ACCA. Like there's a route where you can apply for the BSc in applied accounting for from the Oxford Brooks University. So I'm a holder of that particular degree as well. So yeah. All right, so within this particular annual report, uh, if you see the content page, as you can see, first of all, there would be a message from the acting CEO or rotating CEO, that's specific to this particular organization. And then some business highlights for that particular year. This was taken from 2017, so yeah. And then there's the five-year financial highlights, the message from the chairs, industry trends, Management discussion and analysis is basically some ratio calculations and stuff like that. Independent auditors report is basically another thing, right? Uh, that's, well, only some companies will have to mandatorily include them within the financial statements because some other companies just uh, publish it as a separate document as well. So, yeah. And then there's the consolidated financial statements, including the notes to financial statements as well. Okay. So if I have to go to that section of internal auditors report, let's see. Notes. Yeah, as you can see, this is basically how the consolidated financial statements will look like, right? It's simple as that. And yeah, this is the auditors report. <clears throat> So as you can see here, they have provided the opinion, right? They're saying that the consolidated financial statement summary of this particular company. Oh, well, that's just a reference. Uh, where, 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 where. Yeah, like if you look closely, there's a structure to it. Okay, like the structure is something that we will be learning down the line. First of all, you have to provide the, the title that is independent auditors report to whichever report that there is. Okay. This report is issued by KPMG, right? Uh, and uh, yeah, who is it addressed to is basically shown over here, right? And then uh, the opinion, the overall summary, and then uh, 
what else the responsibilities of management and auditor's responsibility right all of these things would be will, will follow a certain structure to it okay there's also a basis of opinion paragraph and stuff like that not sure why it's not included here but still okay so all of oh yeah because they're referencing it into okay fine all right, so that's basically the overall idea. So there's this structure that every auditor's report follow, and that would be the last, one of the last topics that we will be covering throughout the session. Okay, so yeah. I just wanted to show you this, so yeah. Are you sharing? Okay. So that's basically the report aspect of the five elements of assurance engagement. Okay, folks. So C stands for criteria, R stands for report, E stands for evidence. Okay, not just any evidence, sufficient and appropriate evidence. Okay. All right. So, uh, yeah. So that's basically the overall idea because evidence that we are collecting should be of the sufficient quantity as well as of the appropriate quality as well, right? That's basically the key concept that is covered over here. Simple as that. And of course, why are we why are we gathering evidence exactly? Because our opinion should be backed. As in, see, if you are let's say making an opinion, a simple opinion on anything for that particular matter, right? Then you will have to like back that opinion, right? Because if someone say on what basis are you making this opinion, then you need to have some evidence or some, uh, you know, some reports or some letters or something that proves your point, right? That's basically as to why we're gathering evidence, okay? just to make our opinion strong, right? So if I have to think of a flow, I would say that opinions are based on conclusions that we make and the conclusions are formed using the evidence that we gather. Okay, I'll repeat again, opinions are gathered based on, sorry, opinions are made based on conclusions that we obtained, right? And the conclusion is reached by collecting the evidence or by assessing the evidence. Okay. So yeah, that's basically it. So which is why we're saying that evidence should be sufficient and appropriate, because if we don't have enough evidence, then our conclusion may be wrong. And if our conclusion is wrong, what would happen to the opinion? It will also be wrong, right? So that's basically the idea here. And I can tell you guys that uh, there has been an instance where such a case has occurred. Like, has anyone heard of Enron? Enron scandal? No. There used to, like, as of now, there, there are the big four firms, right? Right? Like, out of curiosity though, like, uh, do you guys like want to get into a big four or something like that? Or like, are you fine with any company for that matter? And if a big four, then which big four? I'll go one by one. Uh, yeah, sure, you can go ahead first. Actually, I've already been placed in Deloitte USI. Ah, yeah, Deloitte. Oh, yeah. You, did you mention that? I think I have missed, missed out on it. Okay, no way. Uh, no, Deloitte, I've right? I mentioned that earlier. Okay, okay, great. Great. Uh, wait, so are you a full-time student or... I mean, you are already placed, right? So how does that work? Like, do you get placed after the exams or something? Because I'm not a campus no, actually, remote, to be honest. So I don't know how the process works, to be honest. Yeah, no, go actually, ahead. Actually, it's my last year. So in the last year, on-campus ah. placement starts. So yeah. Mm -hmm. And Deloitte USI okay. was the first company. So, oh, great. I have a few students there. Uh, where, where were you based out of? I'm sorry, I missed out on that. Uh, my location will be in Gurgaon only. Gurgaon. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Good to know that. And, uh, yeah, who else? You know, uh, some of you are in KPMG and everything. So, yeah, anyways. So, uh, basically, there, as of now, we have the big four firms, right? There's EY, of course. There's KPMG, PWC, and Deloitte, right? There used to be a fifth firm. I don't know whether you guys have heard of it. There used to be a fifth firm known as Arthur Anderson. Okay. So this Arthur Anderson is basically, uh, you know, was a really popular art firm at the time on par with, uh, you know, EY, PWC and all, right? So what these guys did was they were auditing this particular huge organization in the US known as Enron. Okay. 
So Enron used to be a, an organization who used to operate in the natural gas industry. Uh, they deal with multiple diversified portfolios, right? So uh, this particular organization was at the top of the stock, stock exchange. As in people considered it to be a blue chip, uh, you know, stock itself. And uh, their stock price was like on par, like it was really high at that point in time. This was the early 2000s or something around that time from what I can remember. What was it like? Anyways. So at that point in time, uh, when these guys were at the top, uh, you know, later on, like this, when this particular organization issued bankruptcy or something, then they got to know that all the accounting treatments that they uh, that they have used to prepare their financial statements were either manipulated or they haven't followed the accounting standards to its core extent. Okay, and there are different techniques that they use. We call it window dressing techniques or, you know, certainly legal techniques such as that. So uh, I will talk about some of those down the line, but uh, they use many and many fraudulent activities as well as, uh, you know, financial manipulation techniques in order to like shift their liabilities into assets, expenses into assets and stuff like that. Okay. So that's basically the overall idea. So after the fall of Enron, who do you think would also be affected? Basically, the auditors that have provided the opinion as well, right? Enron has been shut down, right? And so has Arthur Anderson as well. Arthur Anderson is like no more. Why? Because they have provided an incorrect opinion, right? Right? Without conducting thorough investigation, right? So, uh, you know, in addition to that company who has conducted the fraud, the auditor who has, uh, you know, who has provided the opinion is also live. Okay. Okay. So uh, I don't know, uh, maybe you guys have heard that, uh, you know, that ACCs don't have signing authority when it comes to uh, within India, right? You guys have heard of that, right? Yeah, like we do have signing authorities in the UK and other European countries and well, in 180 plus countries basically, but uh, not in India. So, uh, when do you think will we, uh, you know, get the signing authority or authority to sign the, you know, financials? Right after becoming a member? Well, technically, yes, but uh, yeah, three years experience is needed to become a member, but uh, uh, we don't sign anything after that. That's the problem. Uh, I'll explain that once. So, I may not have my iPad, but still. Okay. Anyway, which way? So when it comes to the audit industry, right? Uh, hierarchies are different in different organizations, but I'll tell tell you that particular hierarchy on a generic basis. Okay. First of all, the first level that you will have would be the uh, would be the position of an audit junior. Okay. Like some organizations call them associates, right? Like uh, there are different rankings within junior auditors itself, like experienced junior auditors as well as you know. The ones that don't have experience as well, lead associates, some some organizations use experienced associate as well. So yeah, that's different in different organizations. But the first level is the junior uh, junior auditor. Okay, audit staff basically. And from the staff level, you'll get promoted into the senior level. That's like the next level. Okay, and that would roughly take around uh, two, three, or four years, right? Depending upon the organization. So at senior auditor level, uh, you know, we, we're basically more, more, how would you say, more experienced than the junior auditors, of, of course, but more and about that, they're more accountable. Okay, because as you climb the ladder or as you, uh, you know, get promoted into higher positions, your accountability also increases, right? So that's a key factor that you have to consider as well. For example, it, at junior level, if you're only aligned with one client, then at senior level, you may have, you may be aligned with multiple clients as well, right? Uh, and after the senior level, you will have, well, it's different in different organizations. Some people become assistant managers, right? Or some people may become just directly manager itself, right? Uh, depends on the organization's hierarchy. And after assistant manager, if, if there is assistant manager, then after that, there will be manager and then senior manager and then, uh, and then executive, right? And then uh, partner, right? Partner is like the top, top level, okay? So the people who leads an audit would be the partner, right? Right, if you think about it. So the partners would be, would have the ultimate accountability. If the opinion goes wrong, who is liable? The partner is liable, 
okay, partner would be the first person who would be liable, which is why they would have the signing authority as well. Okay, okay. The guy who would be signing off the auditor's report would be the audit partner. Okay, okay. And sometimes there are like for huge clients, uh, uh, I can tell you that for the client that I'm working on, uh, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a huge MNC who is involved in a diversified portfolio industry. Uh, one of the top, uh, you know, clients at EY. And uh, they have around five or six partners just to conduct the audit. Okay. Across the globe, of course. Right. So that's basically, you know, how the amount would be. But the ultimate liability of, you know, whether the opinion is right or wrong, would, it would, would lie with the partner itself. It is a team effort, yes, but ultimate responsibility would be for the partner. And at partner level, you know, you will be using your signing authority. You'll get the signing authority once you are a member, but you'll be using that at partner level. And, you know, that would take years as in, you know, it, by years I would say around, uh, like if you're just a fresher as of now, then, you know, to become a partner, you, you, it would take around roughly 10, 15 years or so. Okay, like you would need about 10, 15 years of experience, bare minimum uh, of experience in order to reach a partner level. So, yeah. All right. So, uh, yeah, I, I know that uh, not not everyone would be interested in that position, but there are people who would be. So, uh, yeah, it's up to you whether to reach that level or should you just stick with the manager role, you know, getting peaceful salary without, you know, less stress and stuff. So, yeah. All right. Uh, anyway, Jules. Moving on. Uh, where did we drift off? Evidence, right? Yes. Yeah. So evidence uh, is basically the uh, idea where we need to obtain evidence to back our conclusion and ultimately the opinion, right? And it should be sufficient and appropriate. Simple as that. Now moving on to the subject matter. The subject matter that is provided by the responsible party on which assurance is given. Okay. It's basically what exactly are you testing as a practitioner or what has the responsible party prepared? If it's the financial statements, then that's the uh, that's the uh, subject matter. In the case of an audit, financial statement is the subject matter, right? And there are several other things as well. We will look into that. Okay. And then there is three parties as well. Okay. The three parties are the three people who are involved within an assurance engagement. First of all, there's the intended user, right? Intended users are usually shareholders, but in addition to that, the other stakeholders are also covered here. Whoever so is relying on the subject matter, whoever so needs assurance on the subject matter is an intended user. Okay. Okay. Because investors or shareholders aren't the only people who would be using the financial statements, right? Different people or different uh, stakeholders will use them. So all of them are considered to be intended users, right? And secondly, responsible party is another aspect. Uh, the management, the person who prepares the subject matter <coughs> is basically the management, simple as that, right? So that's usually who the people are. And then finally, we have the practitioner, which is the auditor in the case of an audit, right? We call ourselves reviewers as well. But yeah, that's basically it. Okay, that's as to who a practitioner is. So yeah, that's basically as to what CREST stands for. C is for criteria, R is for report, E is for evidence, S is for subject matter, and 3 is for three parties. Okay, it's three parties, not third party. Third party has a different meaning to it. Okay, so just keep that point in mind. So I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, so I just put in the chat as well. So what study material are we going to be using? Oh yeah, I noted. I just noted that. Sorry for that. Okay, so you said uh, which we will be following well we will be following our own notes itself right that's basically well the set of notes that i'll be providing you is basically prepared by myself using these all these sources like kaplan vpp and the ecc study hub as well right so you can just uh, uh you know follow those notes itself i would say it's more of a simplified version of a content <clears throat> okay all right so, uh, should we have a study hub also for the questions or the oh, exam kit questions, is sufficient? I would say exam kit is more, you know, see the questions in study hub is more like, uh, how would you say? It's like the example questions within your study text, as in it's just for conceptual understanding. Okay. 
but when practicing questions, you will have to, uh, you know, you need to, what, how would you say? You need a bit more difficult set of questions while practicing, right? So for that, I would suggest the exam kit, so. Okay. So the first step is basically to understand the uh, syllabus itself, right? And basically the second step is to start practicing the questions. I'll let you guys know as to when you guys are ready to start practicing questions, but at that point in time, you know, start with the process. All of you are attempting the September session, right? September, or I guess very rare would be attempting for the December as well. So yeah, okay, great. All right, uh, one more thing. I'll cover the basics first. If you have any other general questions, feel free to let me know. So are these more sufficient for understanding the concepts or uh, do you have to yes. refer any study text also? No, see study text would be, uh, I would, I honestly feel like that's a waste of time because, uh, you know, there's too much content to read and everything, right? So I wouldn't really go for the study text as such. Okay. Exam kit, yes, most definitely is. That's important. But study text is not that relevant. And the questions that are like just after each chapter study text are they important or questions no those are any more you can be that see those that that's okay. what i was talking about as in those questions were like uh it's just to make you sure that you understand the concept right as in some those example questions are just so that you can understand like what that concept is in a bit more simple sense that's just it okay but i don't think like if you're referring to my notes i don't think you would be needing that and Doing that would just be a waste of time. So I would say go through my notes itself. And after that, like if you're done with that, then start practicing the exam standard question directly. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, let me talk about the exam structure of this particular paper, first of all, right? And uh, it's a three hour exam, right? And uh, there are two sections to it. The section A, which contains three OTQs containing the 30 marks E, sorry, 30 marks in total. Okay. Uh, OTQs are basically a situation where you are given a scenario and then uh, five MCQs in relation to that scenario. Okay. Like in ACC exams, uh, for the experienced people, you guys already know the MCQ, each MCQ will contain two marks, right? So five times two is 10. So for each OTQ, there would be 10 marks each. And like that, you have three in section A. Simple as that. Okay. And then there is section B, which contains majority of the marks in the exam, contains around 70 marks. So there's two, uh, sorry, three case study questions, right? One 30 mark case study question, as well as two 20 mark case study questions as well. Okay. Okay. This is basically how the exam structure would be. <clears throat> and when it comes to the time allocation, this is a structure that you can just note it down for the moment, right? Whenever you're start, uh, starting to practice questions, then try to implement this, right? Uh, so, well, ideally, there's a recommendation of using 1.8 minutes per mark as a time allocation strategy, but uh, like for skill level papers, majorly, like uh, I would rather take a conservative approach of using 1.5 minutes per mark. Okay. So, by that logic, for section A, you should ideally take around 45 to 50 minutes. Okay, nothing nothing about that, I would say, right? And uh, for section B, for the 30 mark question, ensure that, see, 
for case study questions, there should be two time phases, right? There should be the reading and planning time as well as the writing time, right? So for reading and planning, what you need to do is, what, what we do is we have to first of all read the requirement, right? What exactly is required, the question, and then the case study scenario, and then you will have to answer the question, right? So this process takes around uh, nine minutes for a 30 mark question and seven minutes for a 20 mark question. Okay. And remaining time should be taken for writing the exam as well. Okay, simple as that. Well, not writing, I guess typing these things. So, yeah. How many of you have experienced attempting or do not have experience attempting computerized exams like in CBE environment? Like for those who are like attempting it for the first time, I guess you guys may not have, oh, you're not there either. Okay. okay. All right then. Okay. Uh, so guys, don't you don't have to be too much afraid of this. As in, like initially, you would have that uh, feeling that it might be difficult to, you know, type in the answer or, or finish the exam on time due to typing speed or something like that. There's nothing as such. I would say because you just need to have an average typing speed. That's it. You don't have to, you know, have that much amount of speed or anything. Like if you have that, it's great. But I'm just reassuring you that uh, you know an average typing speed should be fine for attempting this particular exam. So yeah, in order to improve it, what I would suggest is just while practicing itself, like ensure that you guys are you know typing it it within Excel or Word or something. So I don't think we use Excel as such uh, within this exam. Word, Word or there's also CBE environment. I'll quickly show that one second. Uh, so which exam should be prefer? I'm sorry, which topic? Uh, I don't know whether you guys have heard, but uh, PPP and Kaplan is no longer the licensed, uh, you know, like yes, content yeah. issuers anymore, right? So, uh, but that doesn't that doesn't mean that you have, you don't have to follow any of these, right? You can still follow, you know, PPP or Kaplan for that matter. Well, for from an exam kit's perspective. You know, if you can do both, I would say do both. Okay. Like uh, the more questions that you do, the better, right? So uh, on that basis, then if you can do both, then do both, right? Else you can just do one. And uh, like, there's a lot of resources available within the website itself. I'll just quickly share my screen. <clears throat> Like if you log into your my ACC, like you can you can access that uh, practice platform, right? Uh, so within that, there's a lot of past paper questions and stuff like that. Let me log in. That's a secret, right? What's Like within the study hub, I would say you guys, if you want, right? If you, I wouldn't really recommend it, but uh, you know, since you already have my notes, but if you are a reader or something like that, then you could always refer to the study hub, right? Uh, that's there. 
And other than that, for uh, let's say past paper questions or something like that. Mm, where was it? it? Was here somewhere? Yeah, past exams and question practice. This one. You can log into the practice platform and access that as well. Okay. As you can see, see here, you have the resources for all the papers, right? It's all available totally free, right? So you can just use any of these. A lot of past papers to practice as well, but I would only only start practicing the past papers once you are done with all the syllabus as well as the uh, exam kits as well. Okay, so yeah, keep that in mind. <clears throat> all right, so yeah, just wanted to show you that as well. All right, so do you guys have any other questions as such about anything for that matter? No questions at all? Okay. All right, so uh, can you guys tell me about the class timings that was communicated to you, like, once? What did they say, like, Sunday. weekends? 10 to 12 morning on Sundays, and uh, 4, 4, right? On, okay. <clears throat> yeah, it will be the same. And uh, does weekdays work for anyone? Weekdays work for anyone? If there, see, uh, on an emergency basis, like at times we would be required to, you know, set up sessions during weekdays as well, just in in case of emergency, right? If it if it if it is on a weekday, I would say that uh, it will be in the morning, morning like uh, eight eight to you know eight to ten that particular timeline, I would say. So yeah. Because I know, I understand that there's a lot of working professionals here, right? It takes time to get ready and go to the office. I totally understand that. So, you know, it takes work. So, yeah, okay, great, great, great. Good to know that. All right. So if there is, like, you know, weekday sessions, it will be in the morning itself. Because I myself am a working professional, so I can totally understand, you know, why it wouldn't work, right? So, yeah. <clears throat> All right. If there is no other questions, I guess we can wind up the session. We can continue tomorrow at 10. And in the next session, I want everyone on video. Okay. Guys, give me some response. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, at the end. Yeah. One second. Is it possible to have seven to nine in weekdays if required? Well, uh, I don't think seven to nine would be a right time frame because uh, I myself log off at eight whenever possible. But uh, you know, sometimes it can extend for some people, right? So evenings, I wouldn't really recommend evenings because uh, 
of course, whenever, well, there are people who are working in Google Force and everything, so there would be overtime working as well, right? So I wouldn't really recommend that. So mornings would be more suitable. So, yeah. All right, guys, thank you so much. And I'll see you tomorrow uh, where we can cover more sessions. Okay, folks. So thank you. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you.